In Matthew, the 16th chapter, verses 13 through verse 19, it talks about Jesus coming along with his apostles coast of Caesarea Philippi. He asked his disciples, whom do men say that I, the Son of Man, am? They gave the prevailing thoughts of the day. Some thought he was John the Baptist, some Elias, some Jeremiah, or one of the other prophets, but possibly because of the viewpoint of many of the Jews of that day of the transmigration of the soul. Others, uh, maybe because they knew and could not deny the miracles, the good that he did, but they did not want to admit that he was the Son of God. So he was one of the great prophets of the Old Testament. Jesus turns the question to the apostles, Whom do ye say that I am? And Simon Peter answered for the group, Thou art the Christ, the Son of the living God. Jesus' response to that, Blessed art thou, Simon Barjona, for flesh and blood has not revealed it unto thee, but my Father which is in heaven. And I say unto thee that thou art Peter, and upon this rock I will build my church, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. And I will give unto thee the keys of the kingdom of heaven, and whatsoever thou shalt bind on earth shall be bound in heaven. Whatsoever thou shalt loose on earth shall be loosed in heaven. Caesarea Philippi was a city that was literally built upon a rock. Some have, because of that, said that the rock that Jesus built the church on was Caesarea Philippi. Uh, That uh, is a rather far-fetched view, but there are some who hold such. But it is an important question as to who Christ is. And the answer that the apostles gave, or specifically Peter for the apostle, was that he is the Christ, the Son of the living God. And while there there are some who claim that Jesus never claimed to be the Son of God, yet on this and other occasions he did. As such, he becomes and is the foundation of the church. Uh, Other foundation can no man lay than that which is laid, which is Christ Jesus, is what Paul would write in 1 Corinthians 3 and verse 11. The early church literally was founded upon the fact that Jesus was the Christ, the Son of the living God. As Peter ended his sermon on the day of Pentecost in verse 36 of Acts 2, that God had made that same Jesus whom they had crucified, both Lord and Christ. And since the church and Christ, or the church and salvation are inseparable, there is no other other foundation for salvation other than Jesus being the Christ, the Son of the living God. And he thus becomes the Savior of the body, which is the church, Ephesians 5 and verse 23. But now then, Jesus' statement, I will build my church. Let's look at each one of these statements. First is I. He makes it personal. I'm the one who's going to do it. The church was not built by Adam or Abraham, nor was it built by Moses. Now realize that the term church is used for the Israelites on at times, but we're talking about the New Testament church. That was just the assembly of people in the Old Testament, the Jews. And so Moses did not build the church. Elijah, the great prophet of the Old Testament, was not the builder of the church. Some would have, in fact, many would have the church being built by John the Baptist, and that John the Baptist thus built Uh, baptized Jesus and Jesus, uh, then you had the church, but that John was the originator of it. Uh, But he was not. It was still in the future at this time. Nor did John Calvin build the church. Or Martin Luther with the Reformation movement. 
nor did Alexander Campbell, even though the world likes to many times refer to those of the Church of Christ as Campbellites. Alexander Campbell did not found the church. None of those that we mentioned were crucified for our sins. The only one that was crucified for our sins was our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. In 1 Corinthians first chapter, Paul would write, Now this I say that every one of you say, I am of Paul, and I of Apollos, and I of Cephas, and I of Christ. Is Christ divided? Was Paul crucified for you? Or were you baptized in the name of Paul? He asked those questions always expecting a negative answer, of course, that he was not uh, crucified for them. He, they were not baptized in his name. And thus, he could not be the founder of the church. That's why I call yourself after his name, Paul. The same would be hold true for Peter, Cephas. The same would hold true of Apollos. They were not baptized for the Corinthians or crucified for the Corinthians. They were, none of the Corinthians were baptized in their name, but they were baptized into the name of Christ. They were baptized, and he, or he was the one who was crucified for them. Thus, why be divided? That Christ is the only one who is the foundation of the church because he cru was crucified for the church. He's the one who built it. He's the one who established it. And thus, when they were baptized, they were baptized into the name of Christ. But Christ is the builder. And as being the builder and as being the founder, he has the divine right to decide in matters refer in reference to his church. He has stated in relationship to that church that it is the church of Christ. Now that's, we realize that that's not the official name that God has given unto the church. There's, it is a term describing those individuals that are part of that group that, of which Christ established. Other terms would likewise be acceptable. Any term that recognizes that Jesus is the head of it, that he is the one who is the founder of it. He is that one who built it. And thus, just as, as Church of Christ would recognize that, so Church of God would recognize that. Or the body of Christ, the body of God, the kingdom of Christ, the kingdom of God, all of those terms dealing with the same thing. Any term that recognizes that he's that founder, he's that builder, would be acceptable. But when we get away from that and we start using other terms, then as man has done, man discarding Christ and his name and starting naming itself after other things. Christ established it. It should be called after his name. As far as individuals within that body of Christ, Christ decided what they would be called, named Christian, given above all other names. It's the name that was prophesied of the, in the Old Testament, Isaiah 62 and verse 2. Yet, man discards the term Christian. And he wants to have other terms that describe other things. Or sometimes what individuals will do is they will use a hyphenated term. That they are this Christian or that Christian. Can you imagine Paul as he's writing to the Corinthians saying, well, it would be all right to say Pauline Christians or Cephite Christians. How silly of an idea, and that, yet that's what the religious world has done in relationship to the individual names of Christians today. 
that sometime, somehow it's acceptable to God to have a hyphenated name. Man discards that good and holy name of Christian and attaches other names to it instead. Jesus sets forth the terms of entrance into that church that upon our faith, which comes by hearing God's word, hearing the gospel, we must repent of our sins. We make a confession of that faith that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of the living God. The same confession that Peter made here on this occasion. And then based upon those things, we're baptized in water for the forgiveness of our sins. And it's that point of baptism which takes us from being outside of the church to being in the church. When those on the day of Pentecost received the word, they were baptized, and that, then they were added to the church. Acts 2, verse 41 and verse 47. They were not added to the church upon their faith. They still had their sins upon them when they had faith. They believed in Jesus of Nazareth as the Son of God, as Savior, as that one who is the founder and that one who is prophesied of the Old Testament. And thus they cried out, Men and brethren, what shall we do? Because they had been convicted of crucifying that Son of God. And Peter's response shows they still had their sins upon them. They were not a part of the church yet. They had not been translated into the kingdom of heaven. They were still in their sins, yet they had faith. And so they're told, repent and be baptized for what purpose? For the remission of your sins. Man comes along and says, oh no, at the point of faith you're saved. And then you need to be baptized later on for whatever reason we can't really figure out. But you're saved at that point of faith. They change the terms of entrance into it. We have just read and went over the steps that we must take in order to become a Christian. But what man says is, oh, just say the sinner's prayer. Still wondering where that sinner's prayer is in the Bible. I keep reading and reading and reading, and I haven't found it yet. And... Anytime I ask, no one tells me where it is. But say the sinner's prayer, and that sinner's prayer will save you. No. Christ sets the terms of entrance into the church while man changes it and alters it. He doesn't have the right to do so, and it will not save anyone. Jesus established the worship of the church that we upon the first day of the week come together into one place and excuse me for just talking about you know, during COVID so many congregations of the Lord's church decided well we're not going to have services anymore because of this pandemic we're going to dismiss all services and we want you to join on a Zoom call or we're going to do this other type of service through the internet. Jesus, or the Lord said you come together into one place. 1 Corinthians 11 verse 18 and verse 20. There's no way that you can get into one place and be in different places. It's an impossibility. Even though I had one person argue, oh, well, that is being in one place. You're in one place on that inner. And I asked, uh, he brought up, uh, he had a doctor's appointment recently. I said, were you in one place with the doctor? Well, yes. And so the doctor checked your heart, right? Well, no. Looked down your throat? No. Didn't Looked in your ear? No. Well, why didn't you do that if you were in one place? And, I'm, and I ask, I'm sure the doctor charged you the same amount as if you were actually in his office. <laughs> and he laughed and said, no. 
Why? Because he recognized it was not in one place. God said you come together in one place. And in that worship then to him, you sing songs of praise, songs, psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs. You pray to the Father through the mediatorship of Christ. You partake of the Lord's Supper, the bread and the fruit of the vine, which represents Christ's death upon the cross and the blood that he shed there. We give of our means, putting that money into a common treasury, the church treasury, and we study or we preach God's message. Yet how many have changed that through the years? They bring in an instrument of music to sing with the instrument. Yet Jesus never authorized that. He never established that we pray to Mary or to a departed saint or to him or to the Holy Spirit. He didn't say, well, you can take the Lord's Supper on a monthly basis or on a yearly basis or a quarterly basis or just whenever you feel like it. He set that for the first day of the week. Man changes it. Jesus had the right and he did set the organization within that congregation, individual congregation, that the individual congregation is to have elders who meet those qualifications set forth in Titus 1 and 1 Timothy 3. And then you have all the members. And then within those members, you have those who might be deacons, special servants who meet the qualifications again, found in 1 Timothy 3, in serving or working within specific areas that the elders have need of. But man changes it to a pastor-led system where the preacher is the pastor, or a group of individuals or women involved in it and which is happening in the church too man changes it as if it's theirs to change and to alter how we need to return to the principle that Christ is the founder of the church and it is his right to build it as he wills not as we will but then he uses that phrase, I will build. Notice that this is future tense. It's going to be built in the future. It was not in existence when Jesus made the statement. It was going to be built on the first Pentecost after his resurrection from the grave. And it did not come into effect until that time when his law goes forth from Jerusalem as set forth by Isaiah 2. That church was established based upon that law that it began then. And the church was established based upon that law. But that was after his death, after his resurrection, after his ascension into heaven, to sit at the right hand of God, and thus sitting at the right hand of God to become king, and thus be able to give his law. It was yet in the future. And thus all of those that came before, they were not in the church. They were not in the kingdom. Because it was still future when Jesus makes this statement. So I will build, Jesus says, my church. The term church comes from the Greek word ekklesia. It's made up of a prefix, ek, with the root word klesis. Ek, that prefix, it's a preposition also, means out of or out, <clears throat> out from within. In describing prepositions or their usage, oftentimes a circle will, will be used. And an arrow 
indicating the type of action that comes from that preposition. With ek, you have that circle, and you start it with inside the circle and go out of the circle. Ace, for example, is going into it. Uh, then you have others like upon or underneath or there's other type of prepositions, but ek is that out from within. It's inside the circle. It's going out of the circle. That's the idea of ek when we're talking about ecclesia. Kalesis, which is the root word of ecclesia, very simply means a calling. And so when you put these two ideas together, it is a calling out from within. You are within something, you are being called out of that which you were in. So a called out from within. But when we get, discuss that, we have to understand what we are called out of. And Peter answers that question for us in 1 Peter 2 and verse 9. When he says, but ye are a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a peculiar people, that ye should show forth the praises of him who hath called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. We were in darkness. That's the circle in this case. Darkness is that circle, and we have been called out of that darkness into his marvelous light, the light of God. And so we've called out of darkness into his marvelous light. But the question then arises, how are we called? Are we called by some still small voice in the night? Well, that's what some would have us to believe, that somehow during the night they hear this voice out of heaven that tells them something or gives them something. Others, uh, what we're seeing uh, more and more of, it seems like uh, within the past few decades, is the idea that I had this near-death experience, and that near-death experience called me out of the sin that I was in, and now then I'm saved. Or some of them, it's not a near-death experience. They even claim that they've died and gone into eternity and we came back. Others would say that we're called in various ways. But what does the Scripture say in relationship to that calling? Well, Paul, as he writes to the Thessalonian brethren in the second letter that he wrote, chapter 2 and verse 14, states that whereunto he called you by our gospel to the obtaining of the glory of our Lord Jesus Christ. We've been called by the gospel, that gospel that Paul preached unto them, as we talked about in Bible class this morning, that originated with God and was given to the apostles by the Holy Spirit. It's that gospel that they preached unto them. And through that gospel, by means of the gospel, those Corinthian brethren... And you and I, our Thessalonian brethren, and you and I are called out of that darkness into the marvelous light of Christ. Thus, that's the way, the means in which God calls us out of darkness into His light. Then we notice the possessive case, I will build my church. <clears throat> it is truly His. In Acts the 20th chapter and verse 28, as Paul is talking to the elders of Ephesus, they are at Miletus, he says, To take heed therefore unto yourselves and all the flock over the which the Holy Ghost hath made you overseers, to feed the church of God, which he hath purchased with his own blood. The blood of Christ purchased the church. As such, it belongs to him. The purchase price, of course, was the blood of Christ. But he still is that one who purchased it. 
and thus it belongs to him and no one else. What a man purchases today, if we go to wherever it might be and we purchase something, it belongs to us. And if someone tries to take it and say, well, now then it's mine. Well, police can be called and uh, the person who tries to, take, to apprehend that which we have purchased, well, they can go to jail. Why? Because they're taking something that is not rightfully theirs. Because you purchased it, not them. And thus it belongs to you, not them. Christ purchased the church. My body belongs to me. The church is the spiritual body of Christ. Being the body of Christ, it belongs to Him and not someone else. That's why we use His name in dealing with it. Talking about the church of Christ. The church which belongs to Christ. But since it belongs to Christ, man does not have the prerogative, he does not have the right to change or alter what belongs to Christ. He doesn't have the right to change it or alter it in any way, shape, or form. If man could learn this basic lesson, all religious divisions would end, just would cease that I don't have the right to change what belongs to Christ, what is His, and that He is the one who has the right to establish what is done and what is said and what is taught and what is the actions that are taken within that church. And I don't have any right to change and alter it. If... Had a well in the house over the where we live. There's a carport there. If someone came up and just started tearing that carport apart, and I come out and say, "What are you doing?" Well, I don't like it, so I'm going to tear it off. <laughs> Well, they'd have a little bit of trouble because they don't have the right to do it. Man doesn't have the right to change and alter what God established. Well, I don't like it. Or I like this better. Doesn't matter. You don't have the right to change it. Neither does anyone else. Neither do any group of people. What then should the church be called? Well, again, it's the church which belongs to Christ, the church of Christ. Or as we read there in Acts 20 and verse 28, the church of God, which he purchased. Well, who purchased the church? It was Christ. So that's talking about the church of Christ. He just uses God in relationship to Christ because Christ is God. So it's the church of God dealing with the church of Christ. And Romans 16 and verse 16, of course, the churches of Christ salute you. Someone said, well, that's plural. There's no singular in that. Well, you can't have a, a plural without having a singular. I want to see anyone have a plural of anything without having at least one of them. Any term, thus, which signifies that that church belongs to Christ would be acceptable because it is His church. I will build my church. And we would notice the singular nature of that. He did not promise to build hundreds and thousands of churches as we see in our society today. He promised to build His church. Now, there might be thousands and thousands of of counterfeit churches, but there's only one that is His. 
And it's our duty to be a part of that one that he built and that he established. Then he says that the gates of hell shall, shall not prevail against it. The gates of hell should be literally translated, and as I normally will quote it, the gates of Hades shall not prevail against it. Hades or the Hadean realm. When death comes, there is a separation of the body and the spirit. The body goes into the grave. The spirit goes into Hades. Within that Hadean realm, there's two areas. One is paradise and the other is Tartarus. Paradise is that realm where Jesus went into and where he told the thief on the cross, Today thou shalt be with me in paradise. He's talking about that Hadean realm of which paradise is one part of it. Tartarus is that other aspect and when we look at that historical event of Laz the rich man and Lazarus, Lazarus was carried by the angels into Abraham's bosom. That's paradise. The rich man, on the other hand, went into that place of torment. That place of tar torment is that place of Tartarus. Both of them were in Hades, but in different areas of it. Here, when Jesus says the gates of Hades, he's having reference primarily to the grave. As we go, turn over to Acts, the second chapter, we'll see that this is the case. In verse 27, Because thou wilt not leave my soul in hell, in Hades, neither wilt thou suffer thine holy one to see corruption. What corrupts? It's not the soul or the spirit of man, it's the physical body that corrupts. The physical body upon death goes into the grave, and it corrupts. It returns to the dust from whence it was taken. That doesn't happen to the spirit. It doesn't corrupt. It goes into that Hadean realm of either paradise or Tartarus. Here he is saying that Jesus was going to go into the grave. His body would be in the grave, but it would not see corruption. Why? Because he would be raised from the dead. And thus, verse 31, he's seeing this before, spake of the resurrection of Christ, that his soul was not left in Hades, neither did his flesh see corruption. So the spirit of Christ went into paradise, into Hades. His body goes into the grave. The body was raised up from the dead, and it joined with his spirit after three days in the grave. Now then, upon that foundation, Jesus would build his church. I'm going to build the church, what is, is what Jesus is saying, and the gates of Hades will not prevail against it. We'll get into that last phrase in a moment. But the gates of Hades, when I go into the grave, my body does, and my spirit goes into paradise, that's going to not prevent me from establishing the church. I'm still going to establish it. Why? Because I will be raised from the dead. And my spirit will join with that body. And thus be, and after that, ascend up into heaven to sit at God's right hand. But then that last phrase shall not prevail against it. There's a misconception of many that this refers to the church ever being victorious. While it is true that the church is victorious and will continue to be victorious, yet that's not what Jesus is talking about. The church will be everlasting. There's no doubt about that. It's eternal. It's immovable. In Daniel, the second chapter, as, Dan as Daniel is explaining to Nebuchadnezzar the prophecy that he's given, he says in verse 44, And in the days of these kings shall the God of heaven set up a kingdom which shall never be destroyed. That kingdom's the church. And he says it shall never be destroyed. 
The kingdom shall not be left to other people, he says, but it shall break in pieces and consume all these kingdoms, and it shall stand forever. There's the eternal nature of the church being set forth. As we come over to the New Testament, <coughs> in Ephesians, the third chapter, and verse 21, Paul would write unto him, Be glory in the church by Jesus Christ throughout all ages, world without end. The church will be without, or throughout all ages, world without end. The eternal nature of the church is certainly set forth within the Scriptures. In Hebrews 12th chapter, in verse 28, when this contrast between what they received in the Old Testament as to what we receive, we receive the church. But he says in verse 28, Wherefore we receiving a kingdom which cannot be moved. Let us have grace whereby we may serve God acceptably with reverence and godly fear. There's no doubt that the church is an eternal institution that Jesus Christ built and that he established. But that's not what he's talking about here. It might be included in the meaning, but it's not what he's discussing. The phrase has specific reference to Jesus being victorious over the grave and thus establishing his church. Christ is going to die. He's going to be crucified. His body is going to be taken and put in the grave. His spirit will go into paradise, that Hadean realm. But his death and his going into the Hadean realm will not prevent him from doing what he says in establishing the church. He was instead raised from the grave, which proves him to be that which Peter confesses, Thou art the Christ, the Son of the living God. Notice Romans 1 and verse 4, as Paul would begin his book to them and says that Jesus was declared to be the Son of God with power, according to the Spirit of holiness, by the resurrection from the dead. The resurrection from the dead proved that Jesus was the Christ, that He is truly the Son of God. And based upon that now, He's going to build His church. Him going into that Hadean realm will not stop Him from building the church. In fact, it is upon that foundation and His resurrection from the dead that the church has been built. Something can win, as we all know, a temporary victory, and yet not prevail. Remember back in World War II, as things were going bad for Germany and the Nazis, and they were being pushed back, and then there was a certain, certain surge by the Germans. It's called the Battle of the Bulge, in which Germany won many temporary victories, but in the end they lost the war. Something can be, have a temporary victory, yet not prevail. The grave was victorious temporarily for three days. Yet it did not prevail because Jesus was raised from the dead. And based upon that, he then was able to build his church on Pentecost after his resurrection. Because he had ascended then into heaven itself to sit down at God's right hand and become king and be able to set forth his law. And the church is established. And we can become a member of that church today through our obedience to that same law that Peter preached on the day of Pentecost that was in effect from then until now and will be in effect until Christ comes again. That through our faith, 
we repent of our sins, we make that confession that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of the living God, baptized in the water then for the forgiveness of our sins. And when we do so, we are added by God to the church, that blood-bought institution of Jesus Christ. If you have become a member of that church but have not lived in such a way that heaven would be your home, you've not lived in that way that would glorify God within your life and you realize this, e this afternoon that you need to repent and come back unto Him in obedience to Him. And once again, enjoy the salvation that comes through Christ. Then we can pray with you for the forgiveness of your sins and as a child of God, you can be forgiven of those sins and thus once again enjoy the blessings of Christianity. So if we can help you in this manner, we would encourage you to come as we stand and sing the invitation.